Brett Fabry from, he's the head of law enforcement policy and roadway safety with Kodiak. And Gary McCarthy is the head of first responder policy with Aurora. And they're gonna be talking about some autonomous vehicles and all kinds of good stuff related to that. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Brett Fabry. I'm with uh, Kodiak Robotics. I'm the head of uh, law enforcement policy. Um, this is probably the uh, worst time to present because it's right in the afternoon after uh, everybody has eaten. And just because both of us are up here does not mean this is going to be a comedy show, um, but we'll try to make it as light as possible. Um, just so you know, my background and where I came from is uh, I spent 30 years in law enforcement in California. Uh, my last assignment was working uh, as an assistant chief in headquarters with the California Highway Patrol. Um, I oversaw California's autonomous vehicle program and uh, I'm very involved with, uh, with CBSA as, as well. And um, it was a very easy transition for me from a, a life of public safety and everything is about safety to a life of working with uh, Kodiak and what they represent for uh, safety. And I'll turn it over to uh, my colleague here. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Gary McCarthy. Um, had a first responder policy here at Aurora. I came from, to Aurora from law enforcement, spent 25 and a half years in law enforcement in the state of Arizona, retired out of there. In my career, I was a motor officer. No, you don't have to talk slower because I was a motorcycle cop. Um, worked vehicular crimes for 10 years and then promoted through the ranks and I retired from ADOT in 2020 as the assistant chief over the uniform side, which was port to entry statewide and for international port to entry. Um, the one thing I, that, like Brett was saying, we. We're fierce competitors on what we do. Kodiak, Aurora, it's, you know, we, we try to build the best product and try to be the first to the market, right? We don't waver on safety. We don't waver on you guys going out and going next to Ken Nook's notifications. We, we think about that when we got here talking to everybody. So when we talk to you and we tell you about the technology and we're passionate about this, because we know it can change the outcome of what we see on the roadway every day. So I'm gonna turn it over to Brett and we'll get this thing started. All right, so uh, now that we're uh, done with the introductions, um, so Gary and I each have a presentation. Um, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about uh, technology. Um, I will tell you, first of all, I was a cop, so hashtag not an engineer when we um, talk about uh, all the uh, intricacies of uh, writing code and stuff like that. That is uh, not my forte. But I'll talk a little bit about the uh, commercial vehicle technology. I'll talk about what Kodiak is doing as an operation. And then I'm gonna talk about roadside uh, inspections. And uh, Gary's portion he's gonna talk about with law enforcement is uh, the law enforcement interaction uh, portion. <clears throat> So I think we should first start with uh, kind of level setting a few uh, definitions. Operational design domain, you'll hear this a lot with autonomous vehicles. This is where this vehicle is designed to operate. So for Kodiak Robotics, we are a truck port to truck port um, AV company. We operate class eight heavy duty trucks and we go from a truck port in Dallas to a truck port in Atlanta or a truck port in Dallas to Houston or San Antonio. Uh, for the passenger vehicle side, their operational design domain might be the city limits of San Francisco or the city limits of Mountain View, and that vehicle is designed to operate within that uh, location. So when you hear operational design domain, that's kind of what we're talking about. The levels of automation. Um, you know, there's six levels of automation from zero to five. Um, they're outlined in J3016. We operate at level four, which is at this point right now, we have a driver in the seat, but the the truck can operate without any interaction with that driver. So the truck can perform all that dynamic driving task. For you right now, if you wanna think about it, this is called ADS, this is Automated Driving System. If you have a newer car out there that has uh, lane departure or adaptive cruise control, you have what's called ADAS, it's level one or level two. So it'll do some of the driving task, but it still requires the driver to be involved in that driving task. And then the last thing I'll mention to you is called minimal risk condition. <clears throat> so if something goes wrong with that ADS vehicle, whether a car or a truck, that vehicle is required to uh, stop at a safe location. So for a heavy duty truck, which is what I'm involved in, for us, meaning we have two computers operating, if one fails, that truck goes into what's called a minimal risk condition. That truck will slow down, pull over to the right shoulder, and turn on its hazard lights. That is a requirement we've actually shown uh, so to some of our investors, we have them cut a wire to a sensor on one of our trucks so that we can demonstrate a fallback and they can see how that works. 
<clears throat> this is a, a short video of kind of just get, we'll level set everybody on uh, what Kodiak is and what we're doing. Oops. My video guy, let's see. Well, maybe that's not going to work. All right, moving on. <laughs> so in trucking, there's a lot of pain points, and I think a lot of them have been addressed already. So when we compare traditional trucking to what autonomous trucking can offer, such as the Kodiak driver, the first thing we've talked about uh, is preventable accidents. Obviously, about 94% of collisions are caused by human error. And I think that we've had speakers up here already that have actually mentioned that already about the, there was a list that was put up there, and everything that was on that list were all human factors. So we can make a safer vehicle out there if we can reduce some of those errors, those human errors. These trucks are not going to get tired. They're not going to be distracted. They're not going to speed. They're not going to be impaired. Um, they're not going to be over hours. Um, so this is how we can prevent accidents and why we think the autonomous vehicle is much safer. The second thing is, is uptime. Uptime in the trucking industry is huge. Right now, the average uptime is seven hours a day. That's not a, that's not a lot, and that's, that's less than what a driver is allowed to drive. An autonomous vehicle can basically operate 24-7, uh, you know, stopping for fuel, stopping for inspections, but for the most part can operate for longer periods of time, <clears throat> which makes them much more efficient. We've talked a lot about the uh, shortage of truck drivers. That number is anywhere between 61,000 to 81,000, um, and anywhere in between, depending on who you might talk to. Um, we aren't looking to replace truck drivers, we're looking to complement truck drivers. So nobody wants to operate the trucks on those long stretches from Texas to Florida. Um, it's a boring job. Um, team driving is not very much fun. You know, they've, they've made opportunities for commercial driver's licenses to be easier to get, and it really still hasn't solved that problem. People wanna be home at night, and I think we can all understand that. And then the last thing is, when you can operate these trucks at different times of the day, um, when there's less traffic, you can reduce emissions. If we're not speeding, we're using less fuel, it saves on fuel, it's you know, better for fuel economy, and also um, you know, makes our carbon footprint a lot smaller. <clears throat> so we think we're the only uh, company right now that has a driverless ready truck in the industry, and later I'll show you why that's true. Um, we have a very uh, agnostic system. Agnostic meaning you can take that system and you can put it on different vehicles. Um, in the next slide, I'll, I'll show you what basically this redundant system looks like. All of our technology is based in the mirror pods on the truck. So your LiDAR, your radar, your cameras are all within the mirror pods. There's two computing systems that are operating at the same time. We use what's called redundancy in all three critical systems. That's brakes, throttle, <clears throat> and steering. For example, in brakes, we have three actuators that control the brakes. So if one actuator fails, that truck can go into a fallback and can come to a stop. And we think it's pretty important to be able to stop um, a heavy duty truck. <clears throat> These are some of the problems that we've uh, already encountered as far as like edge cases and use cases, whether it's merging, whether it's um, clover leaves, bridges, um, law enforcement vehicles on the shoulder. One of the common questions I get asked is that, so what happens if there's a law enforcement vehicle on the shoulder? That truck identifies that law enforcement vehicle or other vehicle on the shoulder, moves over one lane if it can. If that truck can't move over, that truck will then move over within that lane to provide as much space as possible to law enforcement. So let's talk about Kodiak, what we're doing as an operations as a company. <clears throat> Right now, we're, we're kind of a company that does um, a lot with very little. So we have 225 employees. Right now, we've driven over 3 million miles. We've mapped over 20,000 miles. <clears throat> we have 34 trucks, and we've hauled over 6,000 loads. We don't haul freight just to haul freight. We haul freight for partners that want to be interested in using autonomous technology in the future within their companies. So we just don't go pick up a trailer just to haul a trailer. We want to do it for companies that want to be involved in purchasing our technology when it's eventually commercialized. So that's kind of a big difference. But we are hauling freight every single day um, along the Sun Belt from Texas all the way across to Florida and Georgia. This is what our map looks like. 
So in those three million miles that we've driven, we've been involved in three incidents where our truck was struck. We were not in autonomy at the time, but that's, that's the, um, what we've been able to show with, uh, with our technology. So right now, our, we have an office in Mountain View, we have an office in Lancaster, we have a trucking hub down in Houston, we also have a trucking hub outside of um, Atlanta, Georgia. Right now, we haul freight every single day up to Oklahoma City, down to Houston. We don't go too far west. Most of everything we do is to the east. One thing that, um, if you're talking about autonomous trucks, is how are we going to inspect those trucks roadside? And this is a problem, right? We don't want to have a truck without a driver inside an inspection facility. Um, if you stop that truck and there's no driver in it, how are you going to inspect that? A lot of involvement involves the driver when you're talking about level one and, and level four, level five inspections. Um, a lot of those things involve the driver. So what happened was is um, about four years ago, a committee was, uh, was put together involving everybody that had some stake in this. That include the federal government, state government, local regular, or I'm sorry, state regulators, federal regulators, uh, industry, all, also law enforcement, and also inspection personnel. And what they developed was what's called the Enhanced Inspection Program. The basis of that program is that, and this is when there's no driver in the vehicle. The basis of that program is, remember I told you going truck port to truck port? So, the scenario would be, we have a truck in Dallas that has a truck tractor all attached, it's ready to launch autonomously. That vehicle is inspected to basically a level one standard. That vehicle is then launched and has to be inspected again within 24 hours. Is that a pretty high standard for uh, my uniform people over here? Pretty high standard, right? How often are trucks inspected right now to a level one standard? About once a year? <laughs> about pr probably about once a year but this was a great collaboration between all these agencies involved CBSA approved this enhanced inspection program but there is still a lot of work to do there's still a lot of questions that need to be answered regarding the enhanced inspection process I can explain a lot of those details but in this next video I want to show you is basically gives you a very good overview of what that enhanced inspection program looks like and how we're doing it. I think I have to. All right, let's see. Where did my, uh, where did my tech guy go? Uh, let's see. Yeah, possibly. Let's see. On a presentation now. Yeah. You can try. Um, if it ain't there. There it is right here. Well, our trap is taking No, that's not it. Let's see. You don't have an arrow on that one. Uh, I see that. Oh, here we go. FMCSA's involvement in the ADS CMV inspection program started back when FMCSA approached CVSA on trying to solve the problem of how do we inspect a ADS equipped commercial motor vehicle in motion. The benefits of the electronic communications at the roadside helps the roadside inspectors be more efficient so they can concentrate their efforts on those carriers that need more intervention than the ones that have proven to be safe. FMCSA's primary mission is to ensure safety of the motor carrier community. In doing so, we're, we're looking to follow this enhanced inspection program to understand how it can be implemented safely and that it would be a benefit to both the, uh, the commercial vehicle industry, roadside enforcement, and also the, the general public. The goal of this project is to collect data and to raise public awareness on automated trucks and how they can be integrated into fleets safely and effectively. The ADS Trucking ConOps project launched in 2020. Since then, we've been focused on collecting information on automated trucks and demonstrating how they can operate on public highways and on inside and outside of ports. 
We've also been collecting information on how they can be integrated with fleets, covering topics such as installation and maintenance, insurance, uh, measuring the roadways and where they operate, safety metrics, testing, cybersecurity, and inspections. The Virginia Tech Transportation Institute team is excited to be here in Dallas, Texas, working with the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, the Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance, the Texas Department of Public Safety, Kodiak Robotics, and DriveWise, working on a new program, Inspections, that has two parts, enhanced pre-trip inspections and electronic roadside verification messages. The, the CVSA Enhanced Inspection, uh, what it does is it allows roadside inspectors to focus uh, their intention on, uh, or attention on vehicles that have not already been inspected by a, a CVSA trained inspector. So it, it's almost they're working together. Uh, the, the enforcement personnel are CVSA trained. They're conducting uh, the inspection on vehicles out on the roadway. Uh, the driver plays an integral role in, conduct, in facilitating the normal roadside inspection. They, they assist with uh, running vehicle components and vehicle systems while that enforcement officer conducts that inspection. The, the cooperative effort between enforcement agencies, technology developers, industry, uh, you know, really came together and worked together to find a solution. Uh, and it really is a, a, a testament to show that great things can be accomplished uh, when all of the parties collaborate uh, together. Kodiak's mission is to build the world's safest driver using autonomous technology. So we've really been a leader in the industry in helping to develop this program. We're incredibly excited about the opportunity to enhance safety on American highways using the Enhanced Inspection Program. At the core of the Enhanced Inspection Program is the idea of CVSA trained inspectors inspecting every truck every 24 hours to an incredibly high standard so that law enforcement has confidence in the quality of the inspection and the roadworthiness of the trucks on the road. As the program kind of kicked off, of course, the intention behind the program is to create allowances for uh, the self-driving truck technology to bypass weigh scales, to figure out how to build in efficiencies and let the truck just continue to keep going. Uh, with that, of course, one of the hurdles in today's trucking industry is the driver-based DVIR, pre-trip, post-trip inspections. And if we don't have a driver in the truck anymore, what do we do? What's the solution? solution and being able to have these inspections, maintain the integrity of the vehicle and the technology and allow it to bypass uh, way stations, bypass law enforcement inspections, but yet still know that this vehicle is sound. Historically, when we look at the causes for, for traffic crashes, whether it be passenger cars and or commercial vehicle uh, crashes, the, the leading causes are typically human factors. We feel like this technology, if fully developed and safely implemented, has the potential to lower our crash rate, remove that human factor, take tired, fatigued, angry drivers off the road, and, and increase highway safety and reduce crashes and highway injuries and deaths. Uh, DriveWise's participation in this is the roadside screening of the autonomous vehicle um, as it's approaching a stationary uh, way station. We have developed some software that is congruent with CVSA's enhanced pre-trip inspection. Um, we call it the inspection client. And basically what that is, is that it's the enhanced inspection that the trained the CVSA trained inspector for the ADS developer goes through before the vehicle is dispatched. They have to have a defect-free inspection before the autonomous vehicle. So we have developed that inspection form. Uh, we've got uh, public APIs that, that allow that the data from that inspection to be uploaded into our autonomous vehicle database. And from that database is where uh, we will draw uh, pass fail as a screening decision as, as far as it pertains to bypass. I think for me coming from previous enforcement experience, um, I have comfort knowing that the vehicle is, is safely operating uh, as it's going down the roads. That once people are exposed to this technology, they will start to understand how they're going to make the roads better for everyone. So one thing I uh, kind of failed to mention at the very beginning about the enhanced inspection process is that a truck is inspected every 24 hours. 
And um, as it approaches a, an inspection facility, as long as it transfers a data set, and let me go back to the inspection portion, that is a no defect launch inspection, meaning there can't be any defects on that truck uh, prior to launch. Once that truck gets close to an inspection station and gets within that geofence, it transfers a data set and the elements of that data set are uh, still being worked out with uh, CBSA and a working group that uh, I'm on along with uh, a lot of other people. Um, that data set is then transferred to law enforcement and then that vehicle is allowed to bypass that inspection facility as long as it has passed the enhanced inspection process and has actually transferred that data set. So that keeps that autonomous vehicle out of inspection facilities. Um, it uh, you know, eliminates the roadside inspection portion. Um, we did, there is no uh, you know, carve out for if you see our truck going down the road and you, um, you know, observe a probable cause violation or an imminent hazard, uh, you should still stop and inspect that vehicle. Uh, but this is to uh, bypass that inspection process. Um, that data set is, uh, along with a lot of el other elements, you know, what are some checks and balances for the enhanced inspection process? Um, there's a lot of still questions that need to be answered that uh, you know, a group is working on, uh, trying to develop some ideas, but it's, uh, you know, it's a very collaborative effort. Um, just remember, this is probably the first time that we'll ever see maybe where government has actually given up control to private industry, and so private industry needs to make sure we get this right. Um, so as part of this enhanced inspection process, I mentioned this data set, we have been doing actually a, a pilot program in Texas, as was mentioned on there with Texas DPS and TxDOT, uh, CBSA, um, also DriveWise, to uh, really pressure test and see how this system works. Uh, we've been doing that uh, program now for about 18 months. Um, and I can tell you, so this is, um, this is what we're finding out in the process is uh, we have five inspectors, um, we have 11 trained. Um, we've been doing these enhanced inspections, like I said, for about 18 months. We've inspected, we've done about 1,500 inspections. We've inspected 1,800 assets. 95 of the percent of the failures are within trailers. Probably not a surprise to anybody. Um, most of those defects are, 46% of those uh, defects are tires, and 18% uh, are lights. Um, Oops. We have found out too that uh, customers will bring us trailers. Remember I told you how, you know, we uh, go truck port to truck port. A customer brings us a trailer, drops it off, it passes DVIR, but then fails an enhanced inspection process. That's how in depth that process is. Uh, we have found that the average time for a combination of vehicles takes about 38 minutes. I think most of us realize is, uh, you know, if Trucking companies did a better, or truck drivers did a better job with DVIRs. We may have safer trucks out there. You know, there's quite a percentage of trucks that are going down the road right now that had out of service violations that are on them right at this very moment that are going down the road. And that's unfortunate. So this is helping with uh, the safety of uh, trucks on our roads uh, just by doing this enhanced inspection process and testing this system to see how this will work in the future. Um, we have also, uh, Kodiak has brought partners to our office in Lancaster and walked them through the enhanced inspection process so that they could get an idea of how they can implement that into their uh, model, how they would uh, to do that within their operations, how they would inspect that truck and deal with launching and dropping trailers and, and things like that. So um, we found it to be a very uh, productive meeting, getting feedback from them as well. And then last thing I want to do is I want to transition a little bit into uh, two different things that Kodiak is doing. Um, I think earlier I mentioned that we're the first, well, I believe, we, we think we're the first driverless ready company. And, and the reason I say that is right now, we are uh, working on private property up in the Permian Basin, which is uh, in North Texas. We're involved in oil field logistics. And right now we are basically hauling sand on a 42 mile round trip without a driver in the seat. We've been doing that for uh, a couple weeks now. Um, it's on private property, so there's obviously uh, much different regulations, but there's a lot of trucks moving around out there. I have a video of this, but I don't know if this will play or not. And it probably won't. Um, but anyway, so we have taken that technology and uh, now we're using it in private property. 
uh, for um, these sand operations, and we have about three trucks uh, operating out there. By the end of the year, we should be operating trucks 24-7 out there in that, uh, that Permian Basin, along with other vehicles out there that have drivers in them, which is weird for them because they pass a truck that has no driver in it, and it makes them think twice. The last thing I want to mention, the other part of when I mentioned our uh, vehicle, you know, has it's a very agnostic system. You can put it on anything. Um, this is something that we're very, very proud of is that we're working with Department of Defense uh, to apply our technology to military vehicles. So if we can apply this technology to recovery vehicles like Ford F-150s and other vehicles to remove our servicemen and women out of danger, um, we think it's a very noble thing that we're doing, and we uh, this is one of the, the most... Uh, I don't know, coolest thing I think that we're doing is that we're helping the military. We have a contract to uh, build vehicles with them. Uh, I will tell you that uh, DOD is putting us through the ringer. Um, we, uh, we go to different places and uh, they give us a map and they say, hey, this is where you need to go. Uh, you have four hours to figure out how to uh, map that all and make it work. And we have passed all of those tests. So um, it's been a very, uh, very good process. And uh, that's all I have. Um, Gary and I will take questions at the end. Uh, my information's up here, but if you uh, want a business card, I'll give that to you as well. And I'll uh, queue up Gary for uh, his portion. Yeah, there you go. Right there. Right there, and. Oh, you want it in presenter mode? Is that good? All right, everybody. So obviously our trucks are better because they're blue, not red. So for the cops in the room, sorry, man, you left us out. So I had to throw something out there. All right, here. I, so a picture's worth a thousand words. And I knew coming in today, most of you have not seen the technology, not seen interactions with law enforcement. Over the last four years, we focus mostly on police law enforcement. But we have EMS, we have tow truck operators, and we have fire that we have to deal with. So we want to make sure, I started with this about six months ago, working on that, went to the fire department safety officer conference and presented there. Having first responders understand holistically how to approach it, if medical knows, hey, it's a multi-vehicle collision, there's two cars involved, there's no one in the truck, or our truck, but there's four pa pa uh, patients in the other car. They can alarm, set two alarms, they can go, if it's a fire, they can go defensive right away because there's no one in it. There just changes the game for public safety. So I want to throw that out there. So when I get to the fire department side, you guys aren't shocked that I'm actually talking to firefighters. All right. So I'm just going to go through our technology real quick and get to the videos. Now, we have 1,800 employees at Aurora, and our headquarters in Pittsburgh. Um, you see an office in Bozeman, Seattle, San Francisco, Mountain View. Our operations is, is in Texas. So we run Dallas to Houston, and we also run from Dallas, to, uh, Fort Worth to El Paso. So the, the run from El Paso to Dallas is 626 miles. So that's a pretty good run. Um, but I just wanted to highlight where we're, oh, wrong direction, folks, sorry. Again, I was motor. For those of you who are DREs in the room, drug recognition experts, this is a standardized systematic approach that this could be placed on any vehicle. Uh, sedan, box truck, or class eight motor vehicle. So that Aurora driver is what we call it, can operate all these different types of platforms. Again, just showing you what it looks like on the different, different platforms where our sensors are. If you look, our sensors look a little bit different. They're not in the mirrors. We have a visor over the top. We have long range, short range sensors on the middle of the, of the cab. Um, and now the same thing applies to the vehicles, passenger cars. Now the reason I highlight this, this is in Mountain View. This is a uh, restaurant that led lunchtime. And the reason I throw this out, how many here have seen this type of video before? Any, any, everybody? No one? Bueller? Just mic on? Anyone? Okay. You tell me a driver that could see all those people standing there on both sides of the street and watch a lady jaywalk in front of the car. The car holds because it sees it. And as soon as she leaves, it turns green in front of it and reengages autonomy. The reason I like highlighting this is you don't see, you, as a human being, you can't see all those things. You can't process it and know for sure what's going on. 
law enforcement interactions. So what we did is we partnered with the Frisco Police Department and Fire Department, and we started doing data collects on public roadways with traffic. I-45 corridor, if you know anything in Texas, it's a busy corridor, freight corridor between Houston and Dallas. We went out there with police motorcycles, SUVs, unmarked trucks, four-door four sedans, and we started interacting with the trucks, making traffic stops from the one number one lane to the number two lane, merging off right, off left. We started interacting with the vehicles. These data collect, so the system's on, but our driver is still maintaining the wheel and driving at all times. We take that data set and we throw it back into the simulation. We run about 900,000 simulations a day. 30,000 of those are first responder interactions daily. So we just keep building that data, that, that, that artificial intelligence. So this is a motorcycle officer making a traffic stop. You can see on the LIDAR behind it, our LIDAR can see up to 600 meters ahead of itself. It's making decisions that far out. But you'll see the motor officer in the video above, you'll see him off to the right-hand side to get in the mirror. But you see the LIDAR picking it up in its box. Once you see its box like that, our vehicle knows, the Aurora driver knows that's an emergency vehicle. Now we know as a law enforcement officer, you don't pass on the right, because that's where they're supposed to go. But on the freeway, if the system's, if the system's backing up, you're gonna end up on the right-hand side with lights on. We have to build that. So uh, Officer Rosinski from Frisco PD, he's coming down the passenger side, but you'll see it on the video in the LIDAR Let's come by, it's boxes, it's, it, it knows exactly what's going on. Motorcycle, any motorcycle officers besides me in here? Wow, okay, that's horrible. Motor officers split traffic, one of the most dangerous things we do. We know what happens when they're trying to get to wrecks, get up through scenes, so we split traffic and we're running right about 65, 70 when, when he initiated that, that lane change, or I call the lane maneuver. So you'll see us pass. You'll see now look, one thing I'll call out is look at the off ramps. Look at all the signage and the other vehicles going the other opposite direction. It's picking up all that on the other side of the highway as well. Not just them next to them, but the car next to us. Uh, and and I'm, at, I'm with Officer Rosinski uh, when, he, when he makes that pass. This is a, just a data clue. This is our normal run we're doing to Houston. The Texas DPS makes a traffic stop. Now you're wondering why aren't we moving over? because there's a car right next to us. We slowed down, but we couldn't move over. But I want to highlight, it recognized the emergency vehicle, started slowing down, and was looking to make a lane change, but couldn't do so because of the passenger vehicle. Officer safety considerations. Now look, ports of entry, way stations, operational design domain, Brett talked about it. We map everywhere the truck goes. It's only gonna run, it's extended to the rail. It's only gonna run in that certain part pretty dynamic in a port of entry. You could have lanes closed, you could have things happen, you could have an issue that's in the port. Being a, a port, when I oversaw the port, we actually had a driver get under the wrong truck to look for the violation, and the guy that was in the truck took off. So we had a fatal collision in the port of entry because the guy was underneath the wrong truck. So think, that, and you, always, you guys all know this, the dynamics in a port of entry are pretty, pretty severe, and it can change instantly. I had a uh, Nogales port of entry, it's on the border, we had issues with people jumping the fence and Border Patrol ended up on the facility with 20 people in a helicopter. That kind of changes how you run port operations in the middle of a foot pursuit. But it changes, everything's changing. So this is the hardest thing to navigate, not for the truck necessarily, but the things we can't control. The people, the pedestrians that's moving in and out. The port on the left, is that's the best picture I can get. It was built in 1947 in the state of Arizona. The IT person told me, it was like, trying to get data into that port's like putting, putting through a coffee stir. And then you have a $28 million port with living quarters on the right-hand side. So extreme. When Brett was talking about the data set that we submit to, that through DriveWise, that's what it'll look like. So in the scale house, when you're sitting there looking at the pre-sorting technology come through, it's, gonna, it's not gonna look any different. You're gonna understand it. It's, gonna, it's green, it's good to go. You can, at a future state with CVSA's database, you'll be able to pull up that inspection through their database online. You can see everything about that, that, that checkpoint or that inspection prior to launch. The one thing you'll notice too is we put the weight on the vehicle. We, we, we scale out by axle before we, we launch. If we're running 78,000 pounds, you're running 38,000 pounds, a maximum braking event's gonna change dramatically. So we wanna know for the Aurora driver what it needs to do and how it can react to those um, things quickly and safely. Fire and EMS. So, <laughs> 
This was unique for me because I was actually in some fire trucks. So any firefighters in the room? This is the first time in my career anybody's ever waved with all five fingers when I was in that fire truck. It was kind of a, kind of a weird situation. But also, I didn't realize, I knew they didn't yield for law enforcement. People never yield for law enforcement. People were racing us through the intersection, full apparatus, lights and siren. They're racing us, cutting us off. A lady was right next to me in the number two lane, and we're in the number one lane, and she's racing us to the call. And I was floored, because I'm figured everybody likes firefighters, they'd slow down. And I'm all over the air horn. They showed me where the air horn was. They probably shouldn't have done that. I wore that thing out that day. We had a pretty good time. But here's some interactions. So this is an injury collision we came up on during the, inter the data collect. If you look, it shows all the cars going through the intersection. It shows the emergency vehicles boxed off, the emergency vehicle ahead of us. But you're picking up every bit oncoming traffic, cross traffic, you're seeing the trees. But also when you look at the video, we had three lane, uh, two lanes out of three shut down, including the left turn lane. Um, and that took us about 35 minutes to clear that intersection. So we were able to run that truck through that scene different, different directions so it picks up all that data. So when it sees the taper, when you talk about traffic incident management, when it seems sets the taper for us, they know exactly what it's doing. Slow down, move over. But this one was one of those organic scenes of the firefighter I was with goes, hey, we just had a wreck ahead of us. So it just happened that we were there and we could collect the data. This one, if you see the fire truck pulling out from the left, now you'll see a car sneak between our truck right there and that pass in that pickup truck. The lady had her phone in her hand as she steered through that between that truck and our, and our uh, commercial motor vehicle. And I'm sitting, I'm like, oh, this can be bad because I figured she's just going to eat the back end of that truck. But again, look at all the information that, that it's processing through, um, where the cars are, where they approach, who's yielding. And you see on LIDAR, she still went through there probably at 40, 45 miles an hour. And it's a 50 mile hour zone, so she let off the gas just before impact. So now we're in an ambulance, we started using a different apparatus, but watch this dump truck come through and uh, lo and behold, he's on his phone as well. And so I get on the radio and I'm calling for Mo to make a traffic stop, I'm Officer Rosinski, and he's like, I'm already out with another traffic stop. He had another, it cut the truck off, uh, the fire apparatus off before. So anyway, so you see, the, you see the vehicle go through there about 45 miles an hour going to a construction site. But again, if you, if you look, when he first comes in, you'll start seeing the back, the smoke of the back duels. He's starting to lock it up and we stopped and gave him an out. But that all happened and again, he was on his phone. CDL driver on his phone. This is a uh, cross traffic emergency ambulance come from right to left. But when you look back at, look at the video, but look at the LIDAR, look how far back at an angle the system is picking up the emergency vehicle prior to the intersection. That perception reaction is a key part of this whole thing. And our perception, our team says our vehicle reacts a little bit slower than your airbag deploying. So that's where that sets for, for deployment. Border Patrol checkpoints. On I-10 corridor between Tucson and El Paso, uh, actually Tucson and, and Dallas, there's a Border Patrol inland checkpoint uh, it's in Sierra Blanca. So two years ago, we met, I met with Border Patrol and said, how are we gonna interact with the Border Patrol inland checkpoint when there's no one in the car? And the Chief Montalongo from Border Patrol said, no one's ever asked us our input, our guidance, or for our assistance since he's been there. He's been there over 20 years with Border Patrol. So we started talking about, we started a pilot program. It was two years, um, the 11th of August, we've been doing this pilot program with the Border Patrol. We've been running through that checkpoint. We have yet to be pulled into secondary. We supply them the truck number, the trailer number, who's in the vehicle at the time of launch, how long it's anticipated till the vehicle gets to the checkpoint. They can come to our terminal, do a free air sniff with their canines, look for drugs, guns, people, and money, because we know criminal syndicates are gonna try to use these trucks for bad things, right? So I guess once a cop, always a cop, you always think about that. Um, but we want to get ahead of it. And Border Patrol has been great partners with us. So here's a checkpoint. Now if, if you look at it, on the lower, you see the, the, the orange box, but a smaller orange box. The system is actually picking up the canine that's next to him. 
and everybody around there, the cones, the buildings, if you look off to the right, you see a person standing off to the right, the secondary, um, and it kind of ties in, but you, even looking through the cameras, you don't see all that detail you see with the LiDAR system. So our LiDAR system, um, we manufacture them out of Bozeman, Montana, and that's, we get the mid, low range, the close range, mid range, and, and long distance range um, interactions. This is another view of that. This is how, it's, a, it's I-10 that gets pinched into the checkpoint. And if you have too much backup on I-10, they've had fatal collisions in the backup in the queue because of the checkpoint. We have had, I uh, was talking to Chief Montalongo yesterday, no complaints from the Border Patrol. They're efficient, they like how, how we do business. Um, I've introduced Kodiak, Torque, who else? What was the other company that went? So there's three companies for sure that we start interacting with Border Patrol but I just wanted to highlight that the complexity of this checkpoint, and there's times that we have to take over, but if you look on the lower, can you guys see the lower right-hand side? It says auto, because you probably guys can't see it over here, but it's in auto, so it's, it's running through this checkpoint in, in autonomy. Our driver's still there, but it's going through it in autonomy. And then another angle of I-10, the center median, where the cars are, you'll see on the opposite side, you'll see cars going westbound just a lot of data and a lot of information. The first time we went through the checkpoint, we had 13 Border Patrol agents looking around, trying to watch it come through, and the truck stopped like 100 yards short. I'm like, why isn't it going? You're in the way, you're a vulnerable user, they don't, it just, it's not gonna run you over. And they're like, oh, so it all kind of tuck in and it goes through, but it was kind of funny, it was just, everybody wanted to see the first time it goes through the checkpoint and they made it stop because they were too curious. All right. Um, no, because it goes into minimal risk conditions. So the redundancies that he talked about with the steering, we do the same thing with our computer system. So, for example, um, good question about hijacking the truck. So if it catches or someone tries to get into the computer and it catches an anomaly or senses an anomaly, it goes in a minimal risk condition and pulls to the side of the road. It notifies our command center. The command center does triage from that. So we'll send a rescue team out but also if an officer who isn't an officer, is just a clone trying to do a, a rip of the truck, when you make the traffic stop and you approach on the right-hand side based on Tim's, there's a, there's a number you have to call that we interact you, with you. We verify who you are and then call your agency to verify that's who you are and that you're out with us on a traffic stop. So there's some redundancy built in, not only from the computer side, but the, the ADS system, but also the public safety side. So everybody asks if our, our vehicle sees animals. You saw it's uh, canine, but watch, you see it, the pink box? That's a bird that it picked up coming through the intersection. So the reason I highlight this is come on, Montana asked us, will it see a buffalo? Um, yeah, we got a sparrow, so we're gonna be good with a buffalo. It's like a car with legs, we're gonna be solid. Um, but that even most people don't even see that. And I saw that and our guy said, do you think you can use this? I'm like, yeah, this, is, this highlights exactly how small we can get. But it also, look at all the other vehicles in the intersection, what it's doing, the surrounding areas. Motorcycles, so we have a backup on I-45. We have all the cars blocked. They're all, the truck's seeing the traffic, but it's also, notif it knows that there's cars, on our tr motorcycles on the right-hand side that knows it shouldn't be there. So that's why they're in red. Okay, this one's a really good one. For those of you who are talking about distance, time distance, 600 meters out, it sees a tow truck off right. We're in the number two lane. At 400 meters, it moves over into the number one lane. So it slowed down, moved over 400 meters roughly ahead of the tow truck. And once it goes past the tow truck, it moves over. So our truck, whether you're a passenger car, a tow truck, emergency vehicle, when we were talking to our engineers, they said state law says you have to move over for police, fire, EMS, tow. I said, but we should do that for everybody because those of us on the highway patrol know if someone's changing a tire, they could slip and fall into traffic. People try to hurt themselves by running across the road and the engineers from MIT have never experienced what I told them. They're like, people do that? I'm like, yeah, it happens. So if we plan on it and we do the best practice every day, then we're gonna at least be ahead of the game, give us another 10 feet to deal with. These are all the agencies that I've, I've talked to and organizations I belong to. The only reason this is up here, this is something that you, for us, you have to get the word out and it's not gonna change by just isolated, siloed conversations. 
we talked about it earlier. Brett and I are fierce competitors, and you know we're doing. We've been doing the um, pilot with Drivewise and Kodiak, but he didn't mention that. So we're we're doing the same Drivewise thing. But the fact is, you have to have people interact with you. You have to understand, and you have to be engaged with officers on the road. I retired four years ago. It changes. Things change. How you do business changes, and each jurisdiction is different. You can't make a unilateral decision and say, oh, this is how it always is, because in law enforcement, there's nothing always. So you have to keep molding and best practices. Tell me what you're seeing out there so we can make this truck adapt and our Aurora driver better. Now, for you law enforcement officers who've been on a while, like Brett and I were, we've seen, <laughs> I like this, Brett likes it because it's just California Highway Patrol cars. He thinks that's cool. But the fact is, we've changed a lot over the last 30 years in law enforcement. We went from revolvers to semi-automatics, went from shotguns to fully, you know, semi-automatic rifles. It changes, it advances. Things always, if you're not growing and changing, it's just gonna pass you by, right? But the fact is, this is gonna change how we do business and drive that number down of the fatalities that we see in the country every year, so. That's my information, and we have about 10 minutes for questions. No, 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 if, if a bird, it's not, even with animals, it'll, it'll take, the reaction time really helps with someone pulling out in front of you, so for time, distance, and things like that, if it knows um, it's going to strike something, it'll stay straight, it won't, we all know that as soon as someone tries to take the evasive action to miss the dog or the animal, that's where the fatal occurs, right, because they go in the center median, I, just go through what you're going and pull to the side of the road. Um, we talk about all those things, like merging. When people try to race you to the merge ramp, we just slow down and let you in. Because there's no, we're not, gonna, we're not in a hurry, we're not gonna do anything that's gonna jeopardize the other highway users. I'm most amazed by your level three, level four, level five discussions. And many people are probably not familiar with the nuances, but with level three, you can sit behind the wheel and it will drive by itself. You know, level four, you don't have to be attentive. You can be doing anything you want and not necessarily behind the wheel. And level five sort of removes the driver's, uh, excuse me, the steering wheel, brakes, and everything else. I think there are only two automobiles in the country, Mercedes and one other, that are registered as level three capable. And you are level four. Two questions. Number one, how did you beat the car industry so quickly? Because there's a lot in competitive advantage that's going to spark as soon as they get to uh, level four. And number five, uh, number two, how, do you, how long before you perceive being able to get to level five? Go ahead. So right now, uh, both of our companies are operating a level four technology with a safety driver in the seat. So that, that driver has not been removed except for that portion I told you about on, on private property. Um, right now, we still, and I, I think we probably both failed to mention that uh, we still abide by all the rules of the road as far as like FMCS, uh, our rules, as far as like hours of service and all that stuff. We still abide by all those rules, um, but we're testing that technology. So for our company right now, um, we've been driving a couple hundred miles. What's actually caused us to stop is that we have to give our driver a break even though that driver hasn't been operating that vehicle for a couple hundred miles. Um, our, uh, our projection is probably the beginning of uh, 2025 as far as when we move the driver. And remember, this is a you know, crawl, walk, run scenario. The, you know, the first, first time we move the driver, it'll probably be on a very short segment uh, of an interstate, and then we will build on that just like you would anything else. It's you know, small building blocks up to you know, a larger, larger block. And for us too, we have a, a safety case framework. We have to close all these 478 safety cases that we have to close before we can launch. Um, and for us, we're looking at the end Q4 this year. Yeah, I, I'll just throw this out. For you that have never driven an autonomous vehicle, they're operating right now in uh, San Francisco, Phoenix, Pittsburgh, Austin. I was in, uh, Phoenix two weeks ago and took a, an autonomous vehicle from my hotel to the airport. And I was the only one in that, uh, in that vehicle. And I'd encourage you, if you'd never had the opportunity to, you know, it's, you've just got an app. It's almost like an Uber app and you're able to go wherever you want fully autonomously. And the degrees that you guys are talking about, level four and level five, are degrees that people didn't think we'd get to uh, before, you know, 
probably 2030, 2035. Well, I agree with you. And, and we always used to joke about, it's like the Jetsons, right? It's so far, my dad was a retired police officer as well. And he's like, I just don't trust computers. And he worked fatal collisions like I did. And I said, dad, when did you work a fatal that wasn't driver error? And he goes, that's true. And I said, now you're in a wheelchair because your motorcycle wrecked, but your car knows where to take you and mom to the doctor, the grocery store. I don't have to take your license from you. Your mobility's changed. So it's, it's really one of, when you start looking at it, you start peeling that onion and how different people can utilize this technology and have more freedom. It's gonna, it's gonna, I think the next 10 years are gonna be pretty exciting, but this is definitely, this isn't a sprint, this is a marathon. We've, we're just on the beginning of, of making this, uh, we only have 100 trucks in the whole industry. It's not like we're gonna take over the trucking industry tomorrow. We have 100, so. Any other questions? And, and there's hey, there's a lot of there's a lot of work still to be done. Actually, I mean this is not this is not baked. There's still uh, you know a lot of hurdles to overcome. This is not a straight line from point A to point B. There's uh, you know there's definitely hurdles al along the way, and uh, you know that's what we're working through is some of those hurdles and um, you know building that safety case. Hey Gary, you, you showed the bird flying by, the ambulance, all those things. What about the uh, a human directing traffic? Have you have you solved that problem? Have you been how, have you, how are you responding to human traffic control? The reason I'm smiling is because I was hoping someone's going to ask me that. So when we were working with Frisco PD and Fire, they, they, they're really great partners for us because they want to learn what we need to do to direct traffic. Now, for those of us in law enforcement and even firefighters, when you're directing traffic, he might do it differently than I do. And when he gets mad, he's definitely going to do things differently than I do, right? You start yelling, you might throw a flashlight, you might hit a Bronco, just, just throwing things out there. Um, but we have to get more uniformed in how we do the, the traffic, or how we direct traffic. You can't be, I think you're gonna have to find a more uniformed uh, traffic direction so people understand exactly what you're asking them to do, um, especially the driver. Because if you do a half, you know, sideways kind of move or you do this overhand thing, it's got to be more uniformed so the truck can pick up exactly what you're asking it to do. So we're going to start testing with Frisco Fire on their on the police department on their closed track so we can start getting those different variations. And we're not going to tell the officers anything. We're just going to have them direct traffic and see what kind of consistency we get and how it reacts. But that's one thing we talked about is just the different um, ways it's being conducted and it's not really standardized anywhere. So today you'd consider that a uh, pedestrian? Oh, it's, it's since you, it, we call it a vulnerable road user. So once you get on the road, it sees you and stops. Now it's, we just got to get it to understand you can right. go through right. or go through this lane. So that's where we're at now. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so my question is, I think that a, a lot of people in the room, um, and you know, you guys come to the conferences with CVSA and stuff, and I think that for the most part, people are um, lean forward into this technology. It's not can we do it, it's how do we do it, and how do we make sure we have all these safeguards in place, right? So that's often, I think, the community you guys are talking to, but there is a demographic out there that is highly skeptical, right? Just highly skeptical, um, either of the technology itself or what it's going to do to their jobs. And I know you guys are the law enforcement liaisons, so it may not be your space, but are you guys as an industry doing outreach to the skeptics to try and help them understand how this may or may not impact their jobs and um, reassure them on the technology? Yeah, we are. I mean, and that's part of what Gary and I do is that, you know, getting out in front of the public and building trust and credibility with what we're doing. Talking with cops is probably the best segment and, and firefighters as well, the best segment to talk to because everybody in here knows some cop or some firefighter. And when they hear about autonomous technology, that that's who they're going to go ask. They're going to be, hey, Gary, I, he I heard there's these autonomous trucks out there. What do you know about those? And so we rely on them to answer those questions. But, you know, that is a hurdle is building that trust and credibility. Um, I think the passenger vehicle side is helping us with that. Um, but also, you know, when something goes wrong, uh, when something happens, like what happened in San Francisco, we all feel the pain from that, even though we're in completely different sectors. And for us, what I do, we do outreach in certain communities. I talk to, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call them antagonistic people, but people that are not like-minded, right? And, and then I show them the video and show them, because it's hard. I can't put, like, I would love to take all, you know, 250 of us and put you in a truck, and then you can see for yourself, right? But once they see it and understand it and realize where we're coming from, um, 
it usually changes by the end of the conversation. It's a whole different thing. But I think it's just, we, as human beings, if we don't know the ending of what's going to occur, we kind of make it up as we go. I think it's going to this way, or this is what I think it's going to be. But really, no one's ever done this before, and you can't, you can't come up with that conclusion. You've got to help, help coach that, right? And I think by us doing things like this, getting out and talking to going to Chattanooga in November to have another conversation with carriers and other people, the more legs we get and more people we see, you're going to start seeing that trust and transparency come up. Also, remember, too, is that, you know, some of the technology, I know there's a lot of people that are probably of that age in this room, and I'm uh, one of those, is that, you know, we grew up, we didn't have cruise control or any of this ADAS technology. So now if you go buy a new car and you have some of that technology, you're learning about that and you're starting to trust that technology where, like you said, Adrian, maybe they don't trust it initially because they're like, oh, I can't imagine that happening. Now they have a new car that has adaptive cruise control. It has lane departure. It has emergency braking. And now it changes the way that you drive. And so that's helping to build that trust and credibility with what we're doing as well. Yes, ma'am. One last question. Um, you guys spoke a little bit about the um, kind of a hijacking scenario mm -hmm. in the mitigation factors that are built in. Can you give us a little bit more insight into what potential hacking risks of the system? So a, I'm not an IT expert, but like a, a total hack of the system and the potential for somebody with an interest in it to take over the vehicle. Okay, so we're both cops. We said that earlier. I'm a motor cop, so I have no idea about IT things. I, okay. I, case in point. So here, here's what I do know. We have the company that we, are, we employ a company to come in and, and do what you're saying. They, they're pros at trying to hack into our systems. We, we pay for that, and we want to see where the vulnerabilities are. We have a third party come through and check our cybersecurity. Um, it's ironic you mentioned this because um, I was contacted this week by FBI. There's an agent out in Arizona who wants to talk to me about just what you're talking about, talking about hijacking equipment, what can we do to mitigate that, what can it be used for. Um, what I know right now is for us, and that this is my second company I worked for, but both the companies I worked for, we had zero um, scenarios where that was hacked by that third party, but that's where that redundancy comes in. So that anomaly occurs with the system, it knows there's a problem and it goes in a minimal risk condition and pulls the side of the road and stops. So our trucks are never, I always <laughs> put this analogy out that there's no one in a basement wearing a robe wearing bunny slippers driving our trucks. That doesn't happen. So once it goes in minimal risk and, or someone says, hey, I want you to do this, the truck goes, I can't do that because it's outside of its operation design domain and it'll pull the side and stop. So all these redundancies are built in at so many different levels that if any anomaly occurs, that's where that minimal risk condition comes in. And now we have rescue teams that go out and rescue that truck. We have a steering wheel, brakes, and gas, so we can take over manually and drive it back to where we need to drive it. But I can't, I can't tell you that, you know, I, I know we have 13 uh, terabytes of data we get off one run. I know that IT-wise, but I don't know the secret sauce of what they're doing to break into the system. I just know it's doing what it should be doing and, and not getting hacked. I can tell you from Kodiak's uh, part is that, uh, you know, we have a Department of Defense contract, so we have an extremely high level, a military style level of um, cybersecurity. We also have a limited number of ports on our computer system for any kind of entry. And then also, both of our trucks operate without any uh, connectivity. So we don't have to be connected to Wi-Fi. We use Wi-Fi to transfer data, but we don't use that to connect the truck or control the truck. The truck operates independently with those two computer systems operating on that truck. And when I started, the computer, the tower in the back was the size of the sleeper berth, and now it's about a quarter of the height of the sleeper berth. It's just like our cell phones, the old brick phones, to now, now we're at now, so it's kind of cool to see. Let me fill in a gap for you over here in terms of the advertising piece. Uh, I'm the DMV director from South Carolina, and I'm on the international board that includes every DMV director across the country, Canada, and Mexico. The discussion that you're having in terms of information and pushing it on out is being addressed at literally every meeting we've got. And uh, there's a lot more that goes to it than just the technical piece. Uh, we are having to deal, for example, with lawyers that are going to get into the, uh, the morality piece. You know, for example, what happens if you're going down the road in this vehicle and you've got trees on both sides and a baby crawls out in front of you and the computer has to make a decision to kill the baby or to kill the family, how do you go ahead and deal with those things? Uh, it will get into 
Um, you know, the, the whole idea of if it, re if it eliminates 90% of the human uh, accidents out there, uh, it may create 10% that have never existed before. Are we as a country going to go ahead and, and save nine lives recognizing it could adversely impact one? And those discussions will take place. Are, are moms going to be able to put their children in a car and send them to preschool without anybody else in there? What are the liabilities going to be with regards to accidents? Is it going to be the truck? Is it going to be the car? Is it going to be uh, whatever you call it, the individual that bought it or the individual that did, did not maintain the car? There's a lot of real tough questions that still have to be resolved, but they're going and doing it through a lot of interactions like this. It's the only reason I'm here is, in many respects, just to listen to what you guys and see where the competitive <laughs> advantage is. Because right now, the biggest problem that I see with the autonomous vehicles is there's such a competitive advantage in technology that we're not sharing information to the complete way that we could. We don't have an FAA like we have with, for example, airplanes that do autonomous flying. And so how does the integration take place? Well, if it gives one, you know, one car manufacturer a competitive advantage that will allow them to sell more cars during the next three to four years, than anybody else out there because they've got technology that's been proven, you know, we're going to have our own issues. And so we're trusting the business end of the community to resolve a lot of those issues. I'm sure that's why you two have been able to get as far out in front as anything else. But the toughest part is dealing with legislatures and more importantly, dealing with a lot of very bad information out there on the entire technology and, and the mistrust that takes place.